and I decided to train AI to be emotionally intelligent. And I remember at the time people going, you are crazy. This was my USP, finding the emotional connection in content and helping people connect to content. Only 36% of us have emotional intelligence. Emotionize AI is, has still built the only generative AI domain model trained with emotional intelligence at its core. Marie, tell me about Emotionize and how did you get started? So my background is unusual when it comes to tech and AI, Mark. So I, I actually spent over 20 years in broadcasting communications. I was a journalist for the BBC I, and SBS Australia, and then I joined RTE and I was an executive TV producer. So um, the Today Show at Moa and Dahi, I set that up. I did, you know, for your listeners, the, the Queen shows, Wild Atlantic Radio, all of that. And I love those. Love those shows. Uh, I, thank I really love them. And actually, it's interesting. That's when I discovered the power of the emotional connection, particularly with Wild Atlantic Way, which is actually 10 years old now. Yeah. When we made that, I was stopped at supermarkets by people who felt very, very emotionally connected to the content. And I realized this was my USP, finding the emotional connection in content and helping people connect to content. And so Orty had a redundancy, um, voluntary redundancy broke up on the table in 2017 and I had a, an entrepreneurial itch that I needed to scratch and I left. But what I also did was I returned to university and I studied psychotherapy. And that was more of a personal choice. I hadn't seen the connection between my business. And originally I said Emotionalize Up as a content creation corporate video agency. This is back in 2018. And then in 2020, I, I had developed a process which was a combination of my good communication skills and use of language armed with psychotherapy and how to target the emotions of your customer. We thought, what if I could scale it? And I saw GPT-3 in 2020 when OpenAI released it. And I realized this was going to change the world. So this was well over two years before ChatGPT was released. And I decided to train AI to be emotionally intelligent. And I remember at the time people going, you are crazy. And don't forget, this is a long time ago. It's five years ago. The term generative AI hardly even existed. We talked about natural language processing and machine learning and sentiment analysis. And I decided to build a minimum viable product. And I put up 30,000 of my own money. I went to my local enterprise office, who I cannot speak highly enough of. I'm based down in Cork, so it was South Cork was my local enterprise office. Applied for a business grant. I put up 30,000. They matched it with a grant of 30,000. That's free money. You know, that's not investing in your, they're not, you know, they don't have a shareholding in your business that you don't have to pay it back. And I built a minimum viable product. That was really hard because I had a great friend who helped me interview computer software development companies. This is back in 21. I, so many, I bet so many people and I said, this is an AI product. And they said, well, we don't do AI. And I said, he said, oh, we can algorithm. And I said, no, this is an AI product. And I found one company who understood GPT-3. They helped. They built it for me. And by January of 2022, we had proof of concept. What made you feel like now is the time to actually put the money down? Because so many of us have the ideas and the inspiration. But until the final moment, we've got a list of excuses that keep us nice and warm. That's a really good question. And um, I, I was very nervous, if I'm being honest with you. And it was my own money as well. The pandemic was a huge factor because I had set up the agency and then, of course, the world stopped in March of 2020. And I actually used that time to start New Frontiers. And so I got into that kind of entrepreneurial mindset. I used a lot of help, again, from Leo and Innovation Vouchers from Enterprise Ireland. And I started to do a lot of research. And do you know who was really helpful to me at the time, I have to say? Um, and he was a former colleague in RTE, although he worked in Dublin, I worked in Cork, was Mark Little. And who went on his own entrepreneurial journey has had two very successful exits. And I really wanted to build an AI model. And I got a lot of pushback from that. And he said to me, I'll always remember, because society wasn't really ready. And in some ways, it still isn't. Society is still very nervous about AI. He said to me, you know, when Henry Ford thought about, asked people what they wanted before he built the car, he said, people would say faster horses. And he was really encouraging. And he said, you've got to build a car. And it was really quite a nerve wracking time. But I think it was the new frontiers being hot housed like that had made me think lots of people have ideas. It's executing the idea and just, just hold your nerve and do it. Please give me 30 seconds of your time. It blows my mind that only 9% of listeners actually subscribe to our podcast. I'm going to ask you one favor. If you like and enjoy this podcast, 
please can you subscribe that one thing will really really help us and the team get you the very very best guests thank you so much i hope you enjoyed today's episode tell me about emer and what does that stand for so we call our ai model emer and we spell it e i m e a or the girl's name because it stands for emotionally intelligent model Emotionize AI is, has still built the only generative AI domain model trained with emotional intelligence at its core. I wake up every morning and I think someone else will have done this. And, you know, Sam Altman a few years ago, who's the head of OpenAI, has said the future of AI is niche. The future of Gen AI is niche. And that's what we've done. So, you know, ChatGPT and Microsoft Copilot will do amazing things. They'll code for you. They'll give you recipes. They're extraordinary. We do emotional intelligence and we do it really well. And what we've done is we've trained it on a combination of my skills, which is good language skills armed with emotional intelligence. So Emer is our AI model. And what it does is it's live, it's dynamic. As you're writing, it's text-based, it's not voice-based. Um, as you're writing an email to an employee or a customer, it's moving in in the same way Copilot does, but specifically on emotional intelligence. And it's basically doing an emotional audit of your, of your text. And unlike ChatGPT or Copilot, it will actually tell you if your writing has good emotional intelligence. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, because what's really interesting is only 36% of us have emotional intelligence. And people get a fright when they hear that. And then they think back on all the jobs they may have had and all the, the, the managers or bosses. And so the, and the other problem is all of us, even those of us who have emotion intelligence, believe we are more emotionally intelligent than we actually are. Very true. Very true. And so... If you think about what ChatGPT does, you're relying on someone to think, is that emotionally intelligent? I'll stick it into ChatGPT and it'll make it more emotionally intelligent. ChatGPT will do what you tell it to do. So even if it has emotional intelligence, it'll double down and sometimes it can make it quite obsequious. And you're relying on the user, whereas with Emer, it's moving in, you know, non-intrusively, you know, nice and very intuitively. And if you have good emotional intelligence, go, this is good to go you're fine. So it's, we've trained it to recognize what's good AI and what isn't. If it feels a sentence might need work, it gives you feedback on the sentence, actually gives you coaching on the job and it'll go, this may feel, make your recipient feel dismissed or undervalued or not particularly, or maybe a little bit fearful. And then it will offer you a more emotionally intelligent replacement sentence. What's the data journey like? The data journey has been fascinating um, and hard, if I'm being honest. Unlike a lot, a lot of other Gen AI companies, we create our own data. So there's a lot of companies out there, they're doing a great job, but they're putting a wrap around ChatGPT and configuring it for another way. We have created, and I'm now realizing, Mark, actually, this has been, this is probably the most valuable thing we've done. For the last three years, we've been creating our own emotionally intelligent data. We hire writers and we create our own software system where they label that data. And we now have quite a rare and valuable data training set. So as you know, large language models are only as good as the data on which they're trained. We're running out of data. And um, OpenAI has pretty much hoovered up about every available pieces of data that you can get. But what now, particularly under the EUAI Act, the provenance of that data and the copyright on that data and whether you've permission to use it is becoming more and more important. And I'm very proud to say a lot of our investment has gone on the creation of that data. People will be surprised to hear this, but AI has become that commodity now. And the data set, that proprietary data set, is that special sauce. Now, a lot of people will say it's always been about the data, but now more than ever, and I remember Rena Maycock sharing her, her story about in Chirp, now, the painstaking work they had to do to get that data. And even the examples you shared of going on that journey, being so thoughtful to say, this is how we go to manage and build out our data sets. That should give you great confidence knowing that very few people want to tread on that journey. It is. And it's not an easy journey. No. No. And, and that, you know, so for example, I mentioned that statistic of only 36% of us are emotionally intelligent. So when we recruited writers to create, help us create our data, we were very clear and that we have a very sophisticated labeling system to create that data. And so we put up ads around third level institutions around Ireland saying, do you want to train AI in emotional intelligence? And we got a really good response. And we created our own fairly rudimentary tests and we were testing the writers in two things. 
good communication skills and judicious use of language. Because if you want to communicate emotional intelligence to somebody through language, that is the weapon that you have. And it's how you use your language, you know, that, that will make people feel connected. And the other look, thing we had looked at was emotional intelligence. Were the writers emotionally intelligent? Because they can't, could have great language skills, but if they weren't emotionally intelligent. And what was fascinating, and this is unscientific, but I thought it was really interesting, only 30% of the people who applied to write for us passed that test. And so we were rigorous from the beginning, even when it came to the writers. And the writers weren't necessarily journalists. They're not. One is a medical student. One is a computer scientist. It was this rare combination of skills that we identified. And we have been religious with our data. What's it been like being in the micro ecosystem, collaborations? What's that been like? In terms of Microsoft or in terms of... Uh, just just the different kind of ecosystem of real Microsoft or any kind of dealings with it, uh, kind of any introductions, networking, have you kind of availed of any of the products or services? Oh, yeah. I mean, Microsoft, I have to say, has been extraordinary and I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, it was really interesting. I, I found out about Founders Hub with Microsoft and one of the biggest reasons we went with them actually was OpenAI. So, you know, we were one of the first startups in Ireland to start working with OpenAI. We started working with OpenAI in September of 21, which is well over a year before ChatGPT was released. And when I discovered Microsoft Founders Hub, they, if you remember back in 20, 20, 2020, 21, Microsoft invested 10 billion in OpenAI. And that was kind of the, the starting gun for what was about to happen. And suddenly, along with LinkedIn membership and, uh, you know, Office 365 and Azure credits, and believe me, we leveraged every single penny of the Azure credits, building AI is an expensive business. Um, I noticed they were giving open AI credits. So I, and in fact, the person I dealt with at Microsoft Founders Hub, I went to him and I said, when are the open AI credits becoming available? This is back in 21. And he said, I'd never heard of open AI until you asked me. So that's how kind of far ahead we were. Um, but the networking is really important. You know, um, we've been speaking at Dublin Tech so much because AI, you and I are extremely plugged into AI and a lot of people here at this event are. But I don't know about you, but I see a big gap between, let's say, AI native organizations like us from the very beginning. We're not a, pro a company that has a little bit of AI built on the site. I went looking for companies to build an AI product and frankly found it difficult back in 2021. But I see a huge gap, excuse me, between where we are and where society is. I don't think they realize what's about to happen. Yeah, once, and I, I, I talk about this a lot, it's the five Ps. It's the people being supercharged or utilizing tools such as Copilot. It's the process where they're digitizing those standing operating procedures. And then it's the product. So they're weaving it into the product and they're staying away from the would it be cool snare part of it. They're just actually bringing it in where it needs to be, order services. And then you've got the place. So the culture, the environment, you innovate, you make mistakes, you're trialing it out. And then the key aspect, which you've obviously got right, is the proprietary data. So you're taking that proprietary data, taking those insights, and you're building it up so that it becomes everything. So I see it as you're going into a place and people who aren't on this journey have got a spoon. Yeah. And how do you compete? How do you offer a service or how do you show that you want to scale when you're actually doing so much work through manual efforts. Yeah. And I worry for society that unless they go on that journey, we're going to leave people behind. But they're already being left behind. Massively. Yeah. So how do we go that digital dexterity for all? How do we bring it into schools? How do we bring it into small businesses, large enterprises? There's all pockets, the silos. But once you start using it, you pull up your sleeves, you're on the book, you're on the drug and you're thinking, is this right? Have I got this opportunity to use these skills? And I would see anywhere from 30% productivity increase to maybe 100, 150%. Yeah. And people say, well, that's crazy. It's like three, five hours a week, minimal, you're going to say from efficiencies. Well, I know some 15, 20 hours a week efficiencies, not to mention the money that you save your business by being more effective. And then the scale of new operations yeah. to do wider, more reaching work. But for society, though, we can't just have pockets. We all need to be on the journey. Yeah. And, this, you know, I think everything, you, I would agree with every single thing you've said. But I think one of the things 
Now, we've been rolling our model out to users over the last year, and it's been fascinating. And this is where I feel really passionately better because I agree with everything you said. But in fact, what we have to bring with us are the people. So people are frightened. They really are. Now, I used to be a journalist and it really is true. If it bleeds, it leads. So they're reading about AI and they're being presented with this very dystopian future. They're worried about their jobs. They're worried about education. They're worried about their children. And then it comes to a, a small startup like us and we're trying to roll our model out. People are also exhausted. They're, they're being asked to do, you know, more with less. And then you roll out a new software tool and you have to like, right, plug this in. And what I think is really missing is that education and communication piece around AI. And you need to be able to generate excitement, like you said, anticipation. And I think companies are kind of just, it's not coming from the leadership down. They're kind of giving tools to people and they're not explaining why it's going to make a difference. One of the ways that we overcome that is we will do demos, but with your documents. So you come with your documents, your journey, then you start to see the tools on your document and then you start to feel supercharged and then you're like, what's in it for me? Oh, I can see that now. Yeah, very good. And that's their love language. Yeah. You're walking the shoes, you're talking in the love language because they're then doing. So then you're not a passenger anymore. You're actually on that journey. Yeah. And that's where we need to do it. And my brother, electrician, speech to invoice, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, 60 minutes to save him a day, rather than going home and doing all this. My mum's a tour guide. Rather than craft up the tour herself, the itinerary, ChatGPT does 90% of it. She polishes up the rest. Yeah. Three, four hours a week. Does it, is it the rocket into moon? No. But is it enough for her? Yes. How do we go on that journey? Very they make good. it relevant. We yeah. are more thoughtful. Much more thoughtful. And I think, and I think we also, you know, we talk a lot, and this is an incredibly interesting conference, and nearly everybody in this room has some understanding of AI. But I actually think, and it's funny, I met Jack Chambers recently, who's now the minister in charge of digitalization. And this change management piece and this psychological piece and this philosophical piece really is something I think we really need to look at because there isn't an aspect of our lives this isn't going to touch. And it's not just for business. If you have young people in your life, your children or your nieces or your nephews or friends, they need to know what's coming, even when it comes to study. You know, I've, I've said this a couple of times, my son is in his third year of a carpentry apprenticeship. His job is probably safer than someone studying accountancy right now. Well, his job, electrician's job, plaster jobs, the dexterity of those jobs, there's no worries or concerns. They will be augmented to a certain element, but it, you're right. Every other job that you thought was in a certain way by 10 years ago, you need me to have a different mindset on it. Uh, Marie Toff, thank you very much for your time today. My pleasure, Mark. Thank you for inviting me. Hello, my name is Mark Kelly, founder of AI Ireland. We're passionate about collaboration and sharing the incredible stories behind every AI journey. That's why we're always looking for guests to join our in-person AI Ireland podcast experience. If you're working on innovative AI projects or have a story that can inspire others, we want to hear from you. This is your chance to share your insights, experiences and ideas with a really vibrant community that's as excited about AI as you are. So if you're ready to be part of this conversation and help shape the future of AI in Ireland, please get in touch today. We can't wait to collaborate with you. Thank you.